Hey there! Today we're going to be rebuking a video my lovely friend Mr. Coltrane has provided me. Most likely to make me suffer. Love you, Braylon. Uh, today's video is called Can a Person Be Gay and a Christian? So let's take a look. My guy. Alright, so one of my followers asked me, Can you be gay and Christian? Now I know this is a tough subject for people to speak about, but I'm going to let the Bible speak for itself. Alright, let's see it. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? In Leviticus 20.13, it says, If a man lies with a man as they do with a woman, they have both committed an abomination. So from that scripture alone, it's saying that if you be with the same gender, you have committed an abomination. So a few quick things here. First, this is not letting the Bible speak for itself. This is reading a passage and then incorrectly explaining what it means. Second thing, this passage has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with homosexuality. The way we use that word today as a reference to sexual orientation. They did not organize their understanding of human sexuality anciently the way we do today. Our understanding of homosexuality as a sexual orientation differs wildly from the way they thought about the motivations that people would have to pursue same-sex intercourse anciently. The Bible is talking about an act of sexual intercourse. It is not talking about a sexual orientation. So in regular term, he basically just said the Bible condemns the action of man having sex with a man and not the desire to do so. So, therefore, homosexuality is okay. The problem, of course, is if you apply that logic to any other sin, it makes no sense. Stealing is wrong, but the desire to steal isn't. Murder's wrong, but the desire to kill isn't. Coveting in and of itself is a desire, and that's forbidden by the Tenth Commandment. Next, this passage does not condemn female same-sex intercourse in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. It is focused entirely and exclusively on male same-sex intercourse because the concern was the violation of a social hierarchy of domination and penetration. In short, men were the dominators and the penetrators. For a man to take a submissive role, a passive, a receptive role in an act of same-sex intercourse was to entirely violate that social hierarchy of domination and penetration, and that was considered wrong because they were at the very top of that hierarchy. This is also why it was considered inappropriate for a man to be on the bottom during intercourse with his own wife. We find this in early Jewish texts, find this in ancient Mesopotamian texts, and from other societies around Israel. This was all about this hierarchy of domination and penetration. The problem with this is the fact that scripture often just says men to mean everyone. For example, 1 John 3, 16-17. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? The verse only says brethren, not sisters. Does that mean, then, that it only applies to men? Of course not. The word brother is used to mean all in Christ. In the same way, the term man, like with man, is used to mean all homosexuality, not just men doing it. And in Leviticus 18, 22 through 23, it says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination, nor shall you mate with any animal. So God puts homosexuality in the same category as bestiality, meaning those who are the same gender and are being with each other sexually is no better than a human mating with an animal. This is not what the Bible is saying, and this is disgusting and hateful rhetoric. Saying nuh-uh is not a valid argument. But why would God allow people to be gay? Here's why. It's because they changed the truth of God's words into a lie. It's because God gave them over to shameful lust. So this is a misrepresentation of Paul's misrepresentation of how the Greco-Roman world got to be the way it was. But before I get to that, I also want to point out that this is an attempt to reduce all homosexuality down to one single explanation that entirely ignores so much of the LGBTQ plus community because it says that God only allows people to become homosexual if they worship the created over the creator. And this ignores the fact that millions of homosexuals around the world were born, raised, and have always been 
committed and faithful Christians. And so this entirely ignores their lived experience uh, so that all homosexuality can be explained as a rejection of God, so that one can maintain the fiction that God only allows them to become homosexuals if they abandon God. And that is wildly inaccurate, and that is wildly misguided. This makes the assumption that everyone who says they're a Christian is therefore a Christian. But what does scripture say? Luke 13, 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Someone claiming to be a Christian than being perfectly content in their sin is not a sign that that sin is okay, but rather a sign that that person is not a Christian at all. Matthew seven twenty one, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. But let's get to Romans 1. This is Paul attempting to explain how the Greco-Roman world got to be the way it was. And Paul starts from the idea that God is manifest in creation. Therefore, anyone who can observe creation must know enough about God to be responsible for adequately worshiping God. And because the Greco-Roman world worships uh, idols and worships the works of their own hands and animals who are God's own creation, they are knowingly a abandoning proper worship in favor of worship of the created. And so in overturning that created natural order, they are abandoning God. Therefore, God is removing these restraints that were placed on their natural passions and everything so that they're allowed to run wild, resulting in such extremities as same-sex intercourse and a bunch of other things. And it is entirely inaccurate. That is absolutely not where same-sex intercourse comes from. And the attempt to deploy Paul's misunderstanding today as an explanation for where homosexuality comes from is misguided and phenomenally harmful. This argument is practically just saying that Paul, and by extension scripture, is wrong. Don't claim to be a Christian if you don't believe the Bible. Which is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's absolutely not the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? We know this for a couple- Correct. Homosexuality wasn't the main reason. There were a multitude of reasons of different reasons. The first is that Genesis 19 does not present homosexuality as the problem. Genesis 19 presents the men of Sodom using the threat of sexually assaulting another man as a means of shaming and subjugating an outsider who is visiting. No. He again makes this argument that this is somehow about submission and dominance, which is not found in the scriptures. What is found, however, is Jude 1, 5 through 7. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroying those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them were in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and gone after strange flesh, and are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, all filled with lust of every kind, including lust for men with other men. So this is an absolutely laughable mistranslation of this passage in Jude, which does not refer in any way, shape, or form whatsoever to men lusting after other men. It uses the Greek phrase sarkos heteros, which means other flesh, which is not a reference to same-sex intercourse, but a reference to the men of Sodom trying to sexually violate angels because they were not sexually compatible. This was actually a big debate in this time period based on Genesis 6, which talks about the children of God having children with the daughters of humanity. And there was a debate over whether or not these were angels or humans, and the sexual compatibility of angels and humans was being debated. And so what Jude is referring to, as you can see from the passages around it that are talking explicitly about the relationships of angels and humans, is saying no, that is inappropriate for humans to be engaging in sexual activity with angels. This is the overwhelming scholarly consensus. No, this is the dispensational consensus that holds to the Book of Enoch as scripture. Which means he abandoned you, allowing you to think unnatural. 
because you don't truly believe in him. Once again, this is an abhorrent falsehood that entirely ignores the lived experiences of faithful and committed Christians all around the world who are homosexuals. Once again, nuh-uh is not an argument. People were so angry that they wasn't allowed to love who they wanted to love that they began to mock God's word. For example, the fake white Jesus that y'all praise till this day is a gay white man. So this is an absolutely ludicrous conspiracy theory that I treat in more detail in my video number McClellan 1297. But in short, there are absolutely no data whatsoever that indicate uh, Cesare Borgia was ever the subject of a painting of Jesus or that he was the gay lover of da Vinci. He had a pretty serious case of syphilis during the year and a half that he was employed by da Vinci, and da Vinci did not paint Jesus anywhere near that time period. Uh, the closest we get is several years later, his Salvatore Mundi, which is very clearly not based on Borgia. And Jesus had been depicted using more European European-looking features for about a thousand years by the time of da Vinci and Borgia's lives. I don't care about Renaissance paintings. Second Commandment violation should be burnt anyway. He basically saying if you pray to him, he is not hearing you because he abandoned you for your lustful, unnatural desires. So this is remarkably naive hateful and harmful rhetoric, and people die every day because of it. The simple fact is that there is not a single syllable of the Bible that is non-negotiable. It is all negotiable, and so much of it has already been negotiated away. Ever since it started being written, it was being negotiated with. The only reason that this remains a central identity marker for so many Christians is because it is useful for the structuring of power and values. It is useful for boundary maintenance. Christians find it useful, and so it stays around. But it will go the way of everything else we have negotiated away as soon as enough people have decided that the lives of those LGBTQ plus people are more important than the utility of this identity marker for our identity politics. We need to get over this. 2 Timothy 3.10-17 through 17. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystria. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work.